Welcome to today's episode of the Blueprint Podcast, where we throw out the old blueprint so we can learn to become who we were always meant to be. I'm your host, Jason Smith. And if you haven't already, click the subscribe button and share the podcast with your friends on social media and tag me in it at JaybirdFit. Today, I have a very special guest for you, Diana Rogers, dietitian, author, filmmaker, speaker, and advocate for sustainable, nutritious, and equitable food systems. Diana, welcome to the podcast. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and your mission and vision. Thank you so much for having me. It's really cool to be talking to a group of people that, that maybe have haven't heard what I'm doing because I'm used to talking people that are uh, pretty familiar with what I do. So um, I'm a registered dietitian. Um, I came into my study of nutrition because I had undiagnosed celiac disease as a kid, um, was super sick. Uh, basically, everything just went straight through me until I was 26 and found out that I have celiac disease, which is an autoimmune condition where when your body uh, sees gluten, uh, the protein mainly found in wheat, uh, you, it starts attacking your own intestines. So basically you, you develop nutrient deficiencies and, and malabsorption. So I've always been interested in nutrition and just trying to figure out why I was so sick and, and, uh, balancing blood sugar and what foods are optimal. Um, and at the same time, I've always been really into nature. I worked on farms as my summer job through high school and college, I ended up marrying a farmer and lived on a farm with him for 18 years where we started out raising vegetables and then realized we needed some form of fertility for the soil. And so we started raising chickens and then that turned into actually every Christmas I would give him a new book on like a different type of animal I thought we should be raising. So, you know, we added pigs and, and sheep and all kinds of animals to the farm. And so it's, it was really great because, you know, you can get these, anyone who gardens gets these like massive zucchinis, right? If you don't mm -hmm. like harvest them right on time. So you yes. can either compost. I'm guilty of that. Yeah. <laughs> You can either, you know, throw them in a compost pile, which is a great thing, um, and they'll slowly decompose, or you can feed them to a chicken and they turn that into eggs and meat. Really great. And then the manure from the chicken is actually like highly concentrated nitrogen and other uh, nutrients that the soil really needs to grow. And so in order to have profitable, self-contained farm system, you really do need that combination of animals and, and plants. So these two things kind of came together as I became a dietitian, which was uh, later in my career, I started in natural foods marketing. I worked for Whole Foods and, and a few other companies and then became a dietitian because I wanted to help other people with what I had learned about healthy eating. And I just noticed that so much of the conversation was uh, around you know, all foods are good. They're everything in moderation, which is is not what I have found in my practice works well for most people. But then also there was a very strong, you know, meat is bad, livestock are bad for the planet. And that's just not what I was seeing through my own health or through what we were doing on our farm. And so that led me, and this is the super fast version of my story, but that is what led me to write the book Sacred Cow and de develop uh, the film Sacred Cow, which came out a couple of years ago, uh, basically defending why meat is a healthy food, why it can be raised in a way that's good for the planet, and uh, also tackling the ethical dilemma of you know raising animals to be consumed, which I know might be triggering to some of the people on your on your podcast, but you know I'm I here to take it on. We don't mind a little controversy here every now <laughs> and then. Why are we defending meat? Well, because we're not connected to how our food is produced, and we mostly live in cities these days. You know, it's helpful to look back at how humans evolved. I've I've done a lot of research into hunter gatherer societies, and and I'm somebody who really challenges culture as we live today. I mean, basically, we're we're living in you know what what we call cafos for animals. I mean, humans are living like that too. We're living in these confined factory like settings where we report to our office job you know, most of the day, not spending enough time outside, not getting the sleep we need, not having the community connection we need, which is why um, I'm, I'm really into your work and, and learning about social dynamics and how can we um, you know, feel better about ourselves and our lives. But also the food we're eating is so far removed from what humans naturally eat. And people seem to like get that with their dogs, right? There's this huge movement right now for natural Farmer's dog dogs. food. Yeah. 
And so people can relate like, oh, dogs aren't meant to eat little pellets. They're meant to eat like, you know, stuff that they would hunt out in the wild as if they were wild dogs. And people are the same. We're not meant to be eating basically the entire inside of the grocery store. That food is uh, stripped of its real nutrients. It's ultra processed. It's full of chemicals. It's it's just not, it's making us sad, sick, and unhealthy. And so we need to be getting back to, you know, what did humans evolve eating? What is the native diet for humans? And that can widely vary depending on, you know, uh, the Inuit people, uh, you know, it was mostly seal meat. And then we've got people towards the equator where it was a lot of fruits and fish and things like that. So people can survive on a wide range of macronutrients, meaning like the ratio of protein to fats to carbs. But what seems to always be the problem is a heavy reliance on ultra processed foods. And so your, your question of like, why are we vilifying meat right now? People are really uncomfortable with how meat is produced. They don't like, you know, our, our relation to animals is that there are pets, there are friends, and it's wrong to eat your friends. People don't understand that humans actually require the nutrients in meat to thrive. There's nutrients that you can only get from meat that we need for brain development. You just can't get them from plants or from ultra processed junk foods. And so, you know, we need those nutrients. And at the same time, the meat industry has done some pretty horrible things um, in the way, you know, they've been allowed to do that because we didn't want to hear about it for the longest time. Now people are looking and they're they're uncomfortable with how meat is produced. Um, at the same time, this carbon emissions debate has really gotten intense. And so people are looking at, you know, ways they can be better environmental citizens. They've heard that saturated fat is bad, therefore meat is bad. So they equate meat with, with an unhealthy food, which is actually not true. And so, you know, it's this perfect triad of horrible things, right? It's wrong to eat beautiful animals. They're going to kill you if you eat them and they're killing the environment. And so in my book, Sacred Cow and in the film, I really break those down and talk about why animal source foods, you know, cooked in the right way, prepared in the right way are actually incredibly nutrient dense and required for not only physical health, but also our brain health. So we can, we can talk about that in a little bit, since that's the focus of a lot of what you do. For sure. Um, environmentally, there are better and worse ways to produce meat, but it can be produced in a way that's actually way better for the environment than any plant sourced food. And then ethically, I, I just kind of talk about that disconnection from death and the fact that it really comes down to people are afraid to die. They don't want to face the fact that death has to happen in order for life to happen. And so, you know, I talk about that. I talk about one animal that can produce almost 500 pounds of meat versus all of the animals that have to die in order for a plant-based system to exist. And so let's start with that. The ethical debate. Yeah. All right. You know, it's interesting. So in my book, I start with nutrition and environment only because it's easy for a philosopher. And I've gotten into debates with philosophers saying, well, it's wrong to kill a beautiful animal. Okay. But then what happens to people if we don't eat meat? Like what are the ethical ramifications of telling these underprivileged kids in New York City that meat is bad and we're going to pull it out of the school system? What, what happens to these kids? Are they going to go get a $12 sweet green kale and quinoa bowl? Or are they just going to go to Subway and get a sandwich without meat. So I think that people should have personal choice. They should be able to choose the diet that they feel aligns most with their values. But then to push a nutrient deficient diet on other people is definitely not okay. And so choosing to opt out of the system is not going to improve the system. And if we really do want meat to be raised, you know, out in pasture and, and kind of the way that these animals evolved living, then we need to change that system, not just completely opt out and tell people to not eat meat. And so what does the current system look like versus the sustainable version of raising cattle? I would say that 
in a grocery store, if you're faced with, you know, grocery store chicken, grocery store pork or grocery store beef, which are the three main protein choices, uh, animal source protein choices there, we, we've got eggs too. that beef, that animal lived the best life compared to pork and chicken, because industrially raised chicken and pork are 100% indoors their entire lives. These chickens will die at five weeks if you don't kill them first, because they are so genetically removed from what a natural chickenish type bird would be. And for for pigs too. I mean, they're highly intelligent. They're right up there with dogs. And these animals are living in really tight conditions indoors, eating only grain their entire lives. With cattle, these animals uh, start off on a calf cow operation out on pasture. They're, they spend most of their life out on pasture. And when they are finished on a feedlot, they are getting some corn, but they're also getting about half of their ration on a feedlot is stuff that we can't eat. That is like the leftovers from the ethanol industry or the alcohol brewing. You know, I've, I've met a lot of farmers who have a relationship with a brewery and these breweries have a lot of spent grains from the brewing process that can either sit in a pile, like I mentioned before, and, and compost down very slowly while emitting greenhouse gases, or we can add them to the feed ration of cattle and they can be upcycled into protein. So you can take two and a half pounds of corn plus the feed, the leftovers, and turn that into a pound of nutrient dense meat that actually has iron, B12, you know, things that corn doesn't have. So as a dietitian, two and a half pounds of corn or one pound of beef, I would say for every single person, that trade off is meat for sure. And when you look at the plant based protein industry, for every pound of plant based protein, there are four pounds of waste that come from that. So if you think of like all the fibers that, I mean, you've got the protein, but then there's all of the other cellulose and everything that can only be fed to a ruminant animal, not a chicken or a pig, but a, an animal that has a digestive system like a cow. So they're quite efficient at upcycling nutrient poor food and they make it in a package that's delicious. That's the most nutrient dense food we can be eating. And so cattle can be finished on grass or they can be finished on a feedlot. There are better and worse feedlots. I've been to a bunch of different feedlots around. And so just because we're driving around and we see these cattle on feedlots and we think that's bad, what we're not seeing are the chickens and pigs that are confined because they're 100% indoors. We're also, you know, not seeing, you know, the better examples or these animals when they're on pasture too. So it can be a little emotionally triggering for people to see feedlot cattle. But uh, a lot of times it's like club med for cows, like they're psyched, they're, they're not in a cage, they can walk around, they get sunlight. It's a relatively short period of their life and they get to transform into meat that can feed a lot of people from one animal. When we get into the carbon footprint of raising cattle, help me understand that a little bit better as far as the, the impact and why we're starting to see so many new restrictions. Yeah. You know, there are so many aspects to whether or not a food is sustainable and, and ecologically friendly. And unfortunately, we have gotten this thing, what I call uh, carbon tunnel vision. So we're only looking at carbon emissions, but we're not looking at soil quality, water holding capacity of the land, biodiversity, the number of you know plants and animals that are in an ecosystem. So when you think of a cow on pasture, think of all the butterflies, all the different, it's not just grass. It's like all these different plants that are out there in the pasture, little buttercups, like all kinds of like beautiful things. It's teeming with life, right? And if you compare that to a, a soy field or a corn field, that is just miles and miles and miles of one plant. It's really bad for the environment to just have one type of plant for the longest, you know, as far as you can see, it's really bad for migrating birds. They have no insects to eat because we're spraying with chemicals and pesticides. I did see a statistic and I'm not going to quote it, but it was a significant amount of animals that actually have to die in order for that crop to be cultivated. Yeah. And I mean, as soon as you start putting numbers against it, people are like, no, it's not that number. It's like, okay, well, whatever the number is, it I've is lived on farms. Significant. Or even organic farmers are shooting deer to make sure because, you know, you're in a beautiful organic farm. We had the most amazing salad bar for deer you could possibly imagine. So we had deer pressure like crazy. And you kind of you if you want to be a successful organic farmer, you have to get rid of slugs, deer, bunnies. People would bring us bunnies thinking, oh, this was this is a happy place for 
thumper to like run around. And we're like, are you kidding me? We don't want more rabbits. We're trying to get rid of the rabbits, you know? Right. So that's what I mean by people are just so disconnected. They don't even grow their own lettuce in their backyard and understand like why you wouldn't want a rabbit eating your lettuce, right? Yeah, or the slugs for that matter. Yes. And so that's that's the yeah. uh, little bit of the story that we go through in the film Sacred Cow with the ex-vegan Lear Keith, where she, you know, as a vegan decides to to grow her own food. She has a slug infestation. What do you do as a vegan with all these slugs? And so she she set up like a little beer cup for them. And then in the middle of the night, she goes out to try to rescue them because she's feeling so bad that they might drown in this beer. And then she thinks, oh, I'll just bring them out to the woods. But then is she displacing the wild slugs that are already out there with these like non-native invading slugs? You know, the, the reality of this whole scenario is that death must happen for life to happen. The birds must eat slugs in order for the birds to live. And humans are omnivores. We actually are. And we need the nutrients in animal source foods in order to live. So getting back to your question about greenhouse gases, cattle are naturally emitting methane because of the way that their digestive system works. So they are chomping on grass, which is carbon. People don't know basic chemistry and biology too. So grass is carbon. The cattle are ingesting carbon and through their digestive system, the bacteria in their rumen are producing methane. They belch out the methane. And after 10 years, that methane turns into H2O, water, and CO2, carbon dioxide. The H2O becomes rain and the other moisture that's part of the water cycle. And the CO2, the carbon dioxide, gets taken up by the plants again in photosynthesis. The C, the carbon, becomes the grass, becomes the roots. It, it gets fed underground to the bacteria and fungal, fungal networks. The O2 gets respired and that's what we breathe, that's oxygen. So uh, the cattle are just basically recycling the carbon that's already existing in the environment and turning it into methane, it gets recycled back into water and carbon dioxide. Now, in the case of fossil fuels, it's a completely different story. In the case of fossil fuels, we are digging up ancient carbon and methane that has been sequestered deep underground from fossilized animals and plants, and we are pumping it directly into the atmosphere when we burn it. There is no natural biological cycle that is taking it up at the rate that we are pumping it out. So greenhouse gases are an issue because of industrialization, because of transportation, because of consumerism and all the junk that we need to think we need to have in our homes. It is not primarily driven by cattle at all. So if you look at the US, if you were look at a, a bar chart, I can send you um, the bar chart that I have showing the ratio of greenhouse gas emissions from transportation, from energy production, from consumerism, industrialization, agriculture is a very small percentage of that. And the percentage of, of uh, greenhouse gases attributable to cattle is even smaller. It's way at the bottom, bottom end. So thinking that giving up a, a burger once a week is going to make any sort of dent in this is preposterous. And also just telling people meat is bad is not good for their waistlines. We know when people eat more protein, they're more full, they're less likely to eat more extra calories later in the day. And so, you know, everyone who comes into my nutrition practice, I actually usually end up almost doubling the protein that they eat because it makes them happy. It makes them full. They'll get better gains in the gym uh, when they when they lift and they're just going to be healthier people in general. So in your opinion, what are the most significant misconceptions or misunderstandings about cattle farming and its impact on the climate. Mm. So in the beginning of my book, Sacred Cow, I actually have like a choose your own adventure section of the book. So you can just go and say, does meat cause cancer? Page 82, you know? And so I answer the health issues, the ethical issues, and also the environmental issues. So when it comes to the environment, we've got a few things. One is that cattle are inefficient with their land use, that you can grow so many more potatoes and tomatoes on an acre of land, and that will only support maybe one cow. But it also doesn't take into consideration the erosion of that soil over time and just the overall quality. That and also that most land is not croppable. So, you know, in America, we're a little spoiled because we have the amazing bread basket in the Midwest. 
uh, which is, you know, really healthy soil that was built by bison uh, pooping on the ground. And uh, but most of the world's agricultural land is either too rocky, too hilly or too dry uh, in order to crop it with traditional crops, but it can be grazed. So if you think about like rangeland in um, the American West, you can't you can't grow soybeans there, but you can graze animals there. So it does take more land, but that's because there's less that can grow there to begin with. And it's really just kind of scrubby marginal land that really only does best with grazing animals. That is the majority of the land that um, our cattle are grazing right now. In the U.S., it's 85 percent of our beef herd right now is on land that we can't crop. So that's that's the number one um, biggest aha moment. That's what got me my book contract, actually, with my vegan publisher who published the China study. Uh, he was like, I'm not so sure about this idea, but I love controversy and hit me with it. And once I explained the land use to him and that you just can't crop everything, it completely blew his mind. And so that's sort of like the gateway into, oh, maybe I had it wrong. Similar. It's, it's also just the natural order of things. Right, right. You can't grow roses everywhere. You can't, you know, grow maple trees everywhere. You can't, it, there's just certain areas where things like to grow. And so we've got other issues like they're inefficient with water. It takes 10 bathtubs full of water to produce your burger. That's ridiculous because one cattle pee. And so the water isn't just like going into some like exploding blimp or something like that. The animals are actually moving moisture around, uh, which is an important thing that they do. They improve the water holding capacity of the soil when they're grazed and managed well. And the most of the water footprint attributed to cattle is actually moisture that's already in the grass. And they count that as water. So the, the drinking water that like the irrigated pumped up water that cattle are actually drinking is a very small, it's only about 3% of the total water footprint of a cow. But uh, these numbers get skewed. So there's much more water used in rice, in sugar, in walnuts, and in avocados than in beef. So there's, there's water. They're inefficient with feed. I talked a little bit about you can't equate a pound of corn to a pound of beef. And we're looking at food in terms of raw calories or raw poundage of food, but we need to be looking at food quality. So one pound of beef is worth a lot more to a human than one pound of corn. I mean, anyone who's watched any of those survival shows knows like the fish that they're catching is a lot more valuable than finding like a handful of berries. It's the fish that's really going to help them out. And so animal source protein is just much more valuable to humans because of the protein and all the micronutrients that are in it. And then we've got the greenhouse gas thing too. I might be forgetting one, but um, those are the main ones. How do you envision the future of cattle farming and its role in sustainable food systems, especially when we start looking at the role of lab meat in our culture? What are your mm. feelings on lab meat? I think the lab meat bubble is going to burst and it's like another Theranos um, it, it's people are, it's a lot of greenwashing. It's a lot of people thinking that they can get rich quick, uh, off this new ultra processed invention. Uh, the reality of lab meat is that it is the production of it's, it's the result of monocrop agriculture that's heavily sprayed, destroys soils, destroys the Gulf of Mexico with all the pesticides and everything. We're taking all of that stuff. We're putting it into a lab high energy uh, usage to convert that into a meat-like substance that isn't even nutritionally equivalent to meat. There's going to be a lot of antibiotic use in there, which a lot of people aren't talking about. But if you have a perfect lab, you know, as a scientist, uh, I can tell you, if you have a perfect laboratory setting that can grow meat, that can also grow a lot of bacteria and other pathogens that are quite harmful. And so you're going to need a way to control for that. And then, you know, pumping that out and marketing it, the profits aren't there. The carbon emission story isn't even there. There was just a new study out of UC Davis showing that lab meat is four to 25 times more greenhouse gas emissions than even standard meat. So they're not winning on nutrition. They're not winning on environment. The ethical story is questionable as well, because they're still a lot of times using animal cells for this. Sometimes it's like fetal animal cells. It's kind of disgusting, gross to a lot of people. So, you know, people are already a little squeamish about it. Uh, but then, you know, if you look at number of lives lost in order for that food to be on your plate, it's not a better story than... 
And I can hear your dog barking no. in the background. <laughs> no, that's fine. Another question for somebody who wrote in, and I think this is going to impact a lot of people for your answer. Are plant-based alternatives, nut, oat milk, Beyond Burgers sustainable and or healthy? They're not healthier. They're ultra processed. The nutrients pumped in are just like taking, you know, a really not so great vitamin. I mean, it's always, we all know that, and no one can argue this, that it's better to eat your nutrients in the form of real food uh, and not in, you know, fortified or uh, enriched foods. So they're not winning on nutrition environmentally. They're not winning the cost too. beyond meat is usually on average about twice as expensive as organic grass fed beef that you can buy. Just, you know, I did a price comparison at Walmart and looked at Beyond Meat and then looked at organic grass fed meat. The Beyond Meat burger was twice as expensive, but they sell it in half pound packages. Most burger uh, is sold in one pound packages. So they seem, uh, there's just a lot of trickery going on, but Beyond Meat has, I mean, they're being sued by their shareholders right now for false marketing. So they're in a lot of trouble. I think that this is a fad that's going to go away. Just like people realized margarine was a big lie and butter was actually a good thing. It's going to be the same for, uh, lab meat. And what are your feelings on oat milk as someone who's lactose intolerant on the rare occasion that i feel like having a little dairy-ish type thing um it's fine humans adults don't really need to be drinking milk uh milk is really good at putting weight on young mammals that's its job in the world so my kids drink tons of milk i don't really eat much uh milk uh but uh, you know i suppose it's good to be there it's it's a white liquid it is not nutritionally equivalent to milk it is not environmentally better than milk in a lot of ways and there's a lot of greenwashing especially by oatly it's they use a lot of really shady tactics in their marketing and then what about raw milk we see raw a lot milk. Of, we see a lot of influencers coming in and yeah. you know talking about the healing and restorative properties that exist within the milk itself and you have to find a good oh, you're just it, trying to set me up to trigger every single possible friend I could make on your show. Well, these are the questions that yes, are I know. really popping up and it's yeah. becoming more and more popular as people look for more yeah. sustainable options and choices. Yeah. Um, so when my kids were little, I did uh, find a small raw milk dairy with a small herd milk by one person that I did was part of a co-op and, and, and I fed that to my kids. They drink straight up milk now because I just can't they don't drink the volumes and I don't have the time to deal with the raw milk thing these days. I don't think that typical milk is a toxic poison, just like I don't think typical beef is a toxic poison. I think that raw milk is overplayed as this panacea cure-all to lots of things when we don't really need it. And I, again, I think milk is really good at putting weight on people, which is usually not someone's goal when they um, are looking deeply into nutrition. And so if, if weight loss is someone's goal, not that it needs to be everyone's goal, but if it is, and you're drinking tons of raw milk, you might want to swap that out for uh, animal protein because there are a lot of calories in milk and it can sort of displace the foods that you could be eating that have uh, less calories and more nutrients per calorie. What are some of the key takeaways or action points that you want your readers or people who watch Sacred Cal uh, to take away? Yeah, that meat is a healthy food, that we're disconnected from our food production, that there's a lot more nuance and context to this anti-meat narrative. And it's important to question things. It's important to not just follow along with what sounds right. And there's just more to the story. I have a course that people could take. It's called Sustainivore. It's on my website. And so I've actually taken the book Sacred Cow and turned it into a course that actually costs less than coming to see me for a one hour consult. So if someone wants to learn about how to help their own bodies by eating a, a healthier diet, how to optimize their protein intake, and also eat in a sustainable way and understand this anti meat narrative, that is a perfect place for folks to start. So they can go to sustainable.com. That was a little plug there. Sorry about that. But no, I love uh, it. Awesome. <laughs> what you're here uh, for. Yeah, check out my film Sacred Cow. Nick Offerman is the uh, narrator. I'm actually working on another project with him coming up soon, trying to get more of this information like to awesome. school students worldwide, bringing the farm right to them. Uh, he's a huge advocate, even though his character is kind of salty on, on 
TV. Um, Nick is actually a huge advocate for all the work that I do and promoting farmers. Uh, he's from the Midwest himself. He really believes in all of this stuff. So he's just a, a great ally to this movement. And then I also have a nonprofit called the Global Food Justice Alliance, where I travel around. I was at the UN climate change talks in Egypt last October, pushing back against this idea that we all need to be plant-based for our souls, for the health of the planet and for our health. It's just not true. And I have the science to prove it. And uh, so I'm out there fighting. I'm getting meat to uh, kids uh, it, through backpack programs, just cool. trying to partner with the NFL and uh, uh, got some meat to a food bank in Cincinnati uh, for a kid's backpack program there, these little meat sticks, which is great. And I'm looking to do more of that. And uh, everyone's donation actually goes to support that program. So, And so yeah. where can everybody go to donate to the program? So that is globalfoodjustice.org, uh, or they can follow us too at uh, Global Food Justice on Instagram. So my main feed is Sustainable Dish, and then my nonprofit is Global Food Justice. That's awesome. Diana, I can't thank you enough for spending time with us today and talking to us about sustainable farming and letting people know that it's okay to eat beef. <laughs> 